Hello everybody. Today's subject is brooding chicks. I had titled it first brooding chicks for dummies and I thought mm, you know there's a series of books called so and so for dummies, um, computing for dummies, raising chickens for dummies which my friend Rob Ludlow co-authored but um, it's really not dummies. It doesn't mean you're dumb if you don't know about it. It just means you're uninitiated. You're a newbie at it. So it's just raising ch brooding chicks for the uninitiated. Now this is specifically talking about brooding the chicks. Before, if you get chicks from a feed store, or you have hatched chicks, um, or somebody gives you chicks, whatever, this is talking about <clears throat> if you don't have a hen raising those chicks. Now I'm going to be clearing my throat a lot. I've got my water. I do. So excuse me, my throat has just been very dry lately, and I don't really know why. So. If you know me, have known me for very long, you'll know I'm a proponent of the basics and the KISS method, the keep it simple stupid. Um, you do what they need, you don't do what you want. Um, I've been doing things this way for 15 years. I've never had a lot of problems in a brooder. Uh, I've encountered weak chicks and things like that. You know, think chicks with uh, defects, probably internal defects miscellaneous things, but in general, um, I've never had a brooder problem, a brooder accident, any kind of thing like that. Well, except for one time when a chick jumped off of something and jumped onto another chick and basically broke its neck. I mean, that was just freak, a freak thing. Um, but, you know, things that I cause, no. So, let's talk about, you go to the feed store, before you actually go, <laughs> decide to pick up chicks, Please get your brooder ready. Please get it ready. Um, I don't know how, it, for however many you're going to uh, brood, please have it ready and heated when you get home. Don't wait till you get home to set it up. Have these poor little chicks get colder by the second in a little box, cheaping their little heads off because they're getting chilled. Okay? Um, and temperature c control for chicks in the beginning is very important because they have no feathers. They have fuzz. They don't have any feathers to keep them warm. Um, once they are fully feathered, they don't need uh, extra heat, but that takes a few weeks. Generally, most chicks, hatchery chicks, feather out faster than breeder quality chicks in general. Um, most of my hatchery chicks were already feathered out by, um, I see this is going to blow my quilt. Most hatchery chicks are uh, fully feathered by around four weeks old. Now, the larger breeds, especially the heritage lines and the breeder quality lines, tend to feather a little bit slower, and the males feather slower than the females. Um, so, keep that in mind, that you're going to be brooding those chicks, unless it's the middle of summer. Now, the middle of summer, you may have a little more leeway, but most people start brooding chicks earlier in the spring when it's still cool outside. But the first three weeks of life is important to make sure they don't get chilled because um, it's been said that an actual chill, a chick's getting truly chilled the first couple of weeks of life can actually uh, make them weaker later on. Um, brooders also need to provide adequate space for your chicks. Um, a tiny little Rubbermaid tub, you know, the regular size, for 10 chicks is going to last you a couple days. I mean, these chicks grow at amazing rates, especially the large breeds. So, you really need to make sure that your brooder is going to be adequate size. And I can't exactly tell you what adequate size is because it depends on the breed you're getting. It depends on if they're hatchery or large or um, uh, breeder quality types. Um, it just depends on a lot of things. Um, I would say you need to start a minimum brooder. Let me see. I would say at least three feet long, two feet wide. I know that sounds big, but honey, they got to have room because they're going to grow out of it. And it also, they poop a lot and they get water. You know, they, they, they poop a lot. There's a lot of moisture in there. And the more area they have to spread out in, the better. Um, also, that has a lot to do with temperature control. Um, Keeping the brooder away from drafts is very important. That's key. You need to keep it out of 
out of the way of windows that are there a lot of airflow. If you have a part of your house where you always feel a draft coming through, don't put the brooder there. Um, you know, first time chicken owners, uh, they're really drawn to those sweet little things and they sometimes make rash purchases uh, before realizing that newly hatched chicks are more fragile than they think. And, you know, there's a huge difference between a chick that's a day old and a chick that's a week old. Um, and there's a huge difference between a week old and a four week old. So, the most crucial time in a baby chick's life is the first week of life. So, when you get them home from the feed store and you put them in a brooder, you're going to have to have your heat set up. Make sure that your heat source, whether it is a ceramic reptile bulb, uh, incandescent red reptile bulb from the, uh, from the um, pet store, um, or regular light bulb that incandescent that actually puts off heat. A 100 watt bulb puts off a lot of heat. Puts off a lot of light too. Puts off a lot of heat. Um, make sure that your heat source is not dead center in that brooder. What you need to do is you need to have the heat source off to one side because you need to provide room for those babies to get out of that heat. So let's just go ahead and continue talking about this heat here. I have some notes here so I don't forget to mention something. It's been a little while since I actually brooded chicks. I've been depending on broody hens for a while. Um, but let's set up your brooder and the bedding. First thing you do to set it up, do not use newspaper. Never use newspaper in a brooder. It's too slick and they can they can actually uh, it'll cause a condition called splay leg, where their little legs, instead of being like this, look like that. And, and, and you'll have to be making splints and, and, and using a band-aid on both, little, uh, both sides of the legs and pulling them back together so they can actually end up standing. Because if you don't fix splay leg, you've got a crippled chick. So the best thing to do, I'll say in my opinion, and this is the way I've always done it, the first few days until they know, until they recognize what their food is, what you need to do is you put down layers of paper towels, just plain old white paper towels. I put, you know, three or four layers down of paper towels. It almost makes a cushion. And I actually brewed in a rabbit cage, one of those long rabbit cages where it's got the plastic bottom and the wire top. I find that is an excellent chick brew. It's, it's a perfect size for a good number of chicks for, for at least two, three weeks. Um, well, maybe two weeks. It depends on how fast they grow and how many you have in there. And um, it's easy to clean because the plastic bottom. But I line that with paper towels. At one end, coming off of one end, I put their heat source. <clears throat> Excuse me. I tell you what, this is getting to me. Mm. It may be pollen starting up. I don't know. Too early for pollen though, isn't it? But at one end, I put their heat source. And I actually put a thermometer under that. Before I ever bring, before I ever put chicks in there, I put a thermometer under there. And I let it sit for a couple hours. And I make sure of what that temperature is going to be right under that heat source. I make sure it's somewhere around 90, 95 degrees directly under the heat source. As, as they move away from that, they can find cooler and cooler areas. You don't want them to not be able to get out from under the heat. That is a problem. They can become dehydrated through the water loss, and they can also develop what is known as pasty butt. Um, that's where their feces actually gets stuck on the vent that comes out of the vent and it stays there, it gets stuck. And it actually can clog them up. And if you don't remove that carefully, carefully, um, they can die. Uh, because they can't poop, they can't live, right? So Make sure your heat source is actually off-centered. And don't put your food in water right under that heat source. Put it away from the heat source. Because you don't want your water being heated up, which causes bacteria. Also, you set up your water. When you set up your little water, I use the ones little quart waterers, um, don't put it on the floor. Lift it up about an inch at the beginning. 
Um, I've been known to use an old fire brick from the back of a, a wood stove. I've also been known to uh, take a potted plant, ceramic potted plant, the bot the base of it, and flip it over and put the water on that. As Sometimes you'll have to put some of that non-skid um, shelf liner so it doesn't slide off because the last thing you want to do is have a water spill and make that whole area wet. But something it can't slide off of. Um, but you want to raise it up about that much. That keeps them from just laying in it and drowning. They can drown in their water because they're babies. They go to sleep. They just kind of fall asleep right where they are. And if they fall asleep with their head in the water, they will drown. So you put that up just enough, just about the level of their shoulder, the level of their neck when they're standing. That's the perfect height for a waterer. In my water, I have some of those uh, like smooth rocks that you get from an, for an aquarium. Like just all kinds of different, they look like river rocks, just for different sizes. I think you, if you look at the uh, river rock at Home Depot that people put in their landscaping, there's all different sizes and there's smooth rocks. I'll put a few of those in the water or just spaced around. What that does is it gives them an object to peck at. Um, if you just have, most water bases are red. And if you just put clear water in there, they can't see it very well. Um, it's easier if they have something to peck at. And I often will bring a chick over there and I'll take my finger and I'll tap like that, like a mother hen pecking on the ground to, to show a chick what something to eat. And if you peck on those rocks, they start learning to peck at the rocks. And when they peck at the rocks, they get their beak in the water and they learn to drink. So within the first 24 hours, you need to get them drinking. Uh, now, when they're shipped from a hatchery, they are, when chick, well, let's just say when a chick is hatched, it is hatched with the yolk sac that was in its egg absorbed into its body. They can live off that yolk sac for up to three days. That's why you can ship chicks to the post office as long as they get it there in three days. Uh, the post office is scary to me right now. Um, but... Once that three days is up, they're going to get weak and they're going to die. And within a day or so, they'll start dropping if they have not been eating and drinking. So get them to drinking within the first 24 hours. The minute you get them home, I stick their little beaks in the water the minute I get them in the brooder. One by one. Take them over there. And they'll, they may struggle because they don't know what you're doing. Take them over, put their little beak in the water, you know, tap on those rocks. And, eventually, and all the rocks also help them keep them their heads above water if they do fall asleep and their their head goes over the edge of the water the rocks kind of keep them out of it for the most part so um, shipped chicks if you get them shipped to you which I don't recommend because then they know who's got chicks and what they have and how many um, but if you do have them shipped to you or they are shipped to the feed store they are shipped still Even they're not shipped to you they're still shipped um, if they are shipped to the feed store or shipped to you, um, they may have what is called shipping stress. A lot of chicks die simply from shipping stress. Um, they have a higher death rate than those uh, you get to, from a local breeder that's, that have never been shipped or that hatch with a broody hen. They have a much higher death rate. I mean, you take them when they're right from the egg, as soon as they're fluffed out, throw them in a box, they're in the dark jostled around for three days with no food or water and they come out into a strange environment and you know it's it, there's a lot of stress involved in that so um, some hatcheries include something called grow gel in their in their boxes it's just sort of a vitamin supplement that they can peck at to keep them hydrated uh, some don't um, and they also, a lot, of, a lot of hatcheries or a lot of feed stores will recommend that when you get chicks, you get this thing called Quick Chick, which is uh, it's sort of a vitamin supplement. Um, it's, I, well, I think, I don't know if Grow Gel is a vitamin supplement or it's just, it's just a hydrating gel. The uh, Quick Chick is a vitamin supplement. Um, I have never used Quick Chick. I've never done that. Like I said, I'm going to keep it simple, just what they need kind of person. Um, I've never used that. I haven't. Some people will recommend you put sugar in their waterer. I would not advise that. That can cause diarrhea, which makes it poopy butt worse. Pasty butt, poopy butt makes it worse. Um, what I have done 
is at the beginning I will take the quart water and I'll put a teaspoon of the organic apple cider vinegar with the mother, the sediment. Shake that up so it's got the sediment in it to put a teaspoon in their water. It seems to help a great deal with a pasty butt situation. And if you start seeing poop stuck to the to rear end of the chick, you, you have to get that chick out immediately, get some very warm water on paper towel or a rag and gently loosen that up and take it. Don't rip it off because you could rip its intestines literally out if you are very rough. Soak off that poop. You could actually put a little bit of Vaseline on that the fluff at the rear end. That keeps things from being able to stick so easily. And make sure you get that apple cider vinegar in that water. That helps, that helps a great deal. Now, if even chicks occasionally, say a weaker chick, who a broody hatches, not, you know, occasionally you'll have, you know, there's such things, birth defects, there are all kinds of things that chicks can hatch with. If you, even a broody hen, you might have a chick hatch that say it's got some kind of internal weakness and it may need a little help and it may develop pasty butt too. You've got to watch for that. You always watch your chicks. Um, but pasty butt can also be like I said, I think I did say this, that it can also be caused by too high temperature in the brooder. If it's too hot and they get dehydrated, they can also get pasty butt. So you got to make sure that brooder is not too hot. Never use a 250 watt heat lamp right on top of a brooder in the house. Um, I, that is extreme overkill. As long as you can get it, if you, unless you pull it way up over it. If you've got right under one corner, one side of the brooder, say one third of the brooder or less, has got a spot that is 90 to 95 degrees where they can go. If they get cool, that is adequate. And you'll find that they don't stay over there all the time. And they spread out if they're comfortable. Comfortable chicks will lay down, they'll sleep, they'll fall asleep at the drop of a hat. If they peep a lot, and I mean a lot like they're distressed, that usually means they're cold. And if one chick, only one chick is cheeping all the time, it may be in pain or it may have something internally wrong that you can't see. But if it's all of them, they're cheeping and, going, and they're huddling each other. If they're huddling together, they can actually smother each other if they get too cold. So you have to observe the chicks and adjust your heat level to what you see them doing. Okay? Powers of observation. The most important arsenal the most important, I mean, the most important weapon in your arsenal is your eyes, your powers of observation with chickens, and that is all, that is, that's across the board. That's not with chicks, that's with your flocks forever. So, by day three or four, they're not receiving any uh, energy from their yolk sac anymore, and if they're not eating and drinking by then, they'll start dropping off. This is another place your powers of observation come in. Do you remember my tiny the terrace? I told you the story about how um, she was in a brood. I hatched a lot of chicks at one time. And she, I watched her. She was very tiny, very a lot smaller than everybody else. But she was running around. Everybody was at the feeder just eating. It was, I had an aluminum base on the feeder. The feed is tan, called light tan. So there's not a lot of contrast there. Well, all the chicks are eating at the feeder and they're just bopping around and they're eating around this round feeder. And she's running over there. She's running across the base of the feeder. And she's looking like, what y'all guys, what are you guys doing? What's going on? And she acted like, she was, she was just very curious, but she never saw the feed. I never saw her eat. And I said, you know what? I don't think she can see the feed. She was on day three when I realized that she could not see the feed. I said, get a hard-boiled egg yolk. I said to my husband, I said, let's mash it up. Get one of those dark blue bowls. Let's mash up some egg yolk in that blue bowl. Let's put her in there and let's see if she can actually see it. We put her in, the, it was a big wide base, and she was a tiny little chick. I put her in this bowl, tapped on that egg yolk, and she started eating and singing, singing. I said, Contrast. She can see that. She couldn't see the tan food in the in the aluminum feeder, in the silver feeder. So I said, go get the red long chick feeder. We put the feed in that, and from then on, she was fine. She could eat tan feed, red feeder. She could see the contrast. So if I had not been watching and observing, she would have died. And you know what I would have thought? Failure to thrive. That is another thing. Failure to thrive. 
is a condition where you can see nothing wrong with a chick and it may be eating and drinking and then stop and get lethargic and just pass away. It just never really grows or it never really acts normal and it just passes away eventually. And it usually happens within the first two weeks. Failure to thrive, it does happen. And it can be something as simple as an de internal defect that obviously you're not going to be able to see. So, you know, it, there's really nothing you can do about that. It's just a harsh reality. It's just the way it is. So let me see what else I need to say here. Um, we talked about too high a temperature in the brooder, how you don't want the whole brooder hot. Um, you want a big enough brooder. And I would also say um, have another area uh, ready to go for when that brooder seems like it is just too big. Um, I like to put paper towels down the first two or three days. By that time, they know where their food is and they're all eating and drinking. If, if you're lucky and you've, you've paid attention, they're all eating and drinking, sleeping, everything's good. Then what you can do is you can roll... When the paper towels get too messy, you don't want it wet. You want to make sure that their environment is clean and dry. Well, dry. And you don't. You want to make sure the water is not leaking, tipping over, that they're not playing in and getting wet everywhere. You just want to make sure that everything's dry. And that those paper towels help you see if there's a leak or if there's a problem with the waterer. So, first two or three days, paper towels. Um, and then you can just take it and go from one end and just roll it up. And I move the chicks as I roll these paper towels. And then I take more paper towels and lay them out. So I may change them a couple of three times uh, in the two or three days. Maybe more than that. depends on how messy they are. Um, there will be a lot of feed waste in there. I have not yet found a way for chicks not to waste feed. They will waste a lot of feed at the beginning. Okay. After they're, everything's fine, everybody's it's all humming along and they're thriving, they seem to be thriving, then you may find it may start to smell a little bit in your house. What you may want to do at that point is introduce pine shavings. Make sure they're not tiny little sawdust pine shavings because they're more likely to eat those, but just pine shavings. Um, I start putting pine shavings in there. Pine shavings keep the smell down. Um, never use cedar with your chicks, ever. You may think, oh, this is a great idea. We'll use cedar, and cedar will keep the smell down. It'll kill your chicks. Cedar is highly aromatic. You never use high aromatics with chickens, especially chicks who are right there floor level. Never. So um, change the pine shavings. It's easier then to just stir around the pine shavings a little bit, let all the poop drop to the bottom, and, you know, do that a few times. And when it gets too poopy, you can scoop them out and put some fresh. So um, that's the way I do that. Uh, let me see what else to do. Oh, brooders. Now, I've always used a brooder lamp. However, there is a radiant heater, a uh, brooder heater called an Echo Glow. And um, it is, it's just a little thing on a base. It's got two little short legs. It has radiant heat underneath. It's tall enough for little chicks to run under it to get warm. Sometimes they start roosting on top of it. Um, so, it's up to you which type of heat you want to use. Just don't do too much heat and make sure they have they they can get away from that heat spot that's extremely important okay what is next uh, keep their water poop free that's important yeah you're gonna have to empty that water tray a lot because they're gonna poop in it um, so make sure you have a larger space for them to go when that brooder is outgrown um, let's see what else do I want to do? I talked to you about newspaper. You don't want to do newspaper. Newspaper is dangerous for them. Um, okay, what to feed them? <clears throat> okay, feed them only chick starter crumble. Only. You don't need to give them any what people call treats. <laughs> treats. Um, unlike people, chicks don't eat for pleasure. They eat to live. I mean, that's, they have to eat. They eat. They eat a lot. They grow fast. Um, so, good nutrition is the key to that. Um, 
a chick starter crumble, whether you use a starter grower combination or a starter and then you go to a grower or whatever. I've never been able to just to use a separate grower because my area doesn't really have things like that very very much and I don't like tractor supply feeds. Um, <clears throat> I have bought some of them, but only the ones where it's got plastic and I can see in there and see there's not mold in there because they're kind of famous for moldy feed in my in some areas. Um, but chick starter you, I'm going to link to my video about medicated versus non-medicated feed. Um, that's a whole other subject for a different video, but you need to watch that uh, to decide what you want to do about that. Um, but the protein levels are important. It should be a starter grower combination should be 18% minimum protein level. Um, slightly higher is better, especially with heritage breeds, large frame breeds. Um, 28% like a game bird starter is truly a little too high for chickens. I know some people have used that. Um, it's better to go a little high than too low. But I've never used 28% starter like for my guineas for my chickens, for my chicken chicks. Um, I would say a range of between 20% and 24% in starter protein level is perfection. Perfect. Um, but I very often use the 18% starter grower for all my other breeds. The Brahmas got uh, 20 to 24%. Um, clean water is extremely important for sure. <clears throat> but, you know, chickens do need heat. Uh, there, I, some areas in the country, <clears throat> I've come across pretty ignorant people. Uh, at flea market one time around Easter, my least favorite time to have anything to even go to any feed store. Um, I Easter chicks are the worst idea on the planet. Easter anything is the worst idea on the planet. Uh, has nothing to do with the holiday whatsoever, and um, it's an excuse people use to make rash decisions to buy animals they shouldn't have. Oh, look at the cute chick. It's all dyed with pink and purple. Oh, that just turns me off. I hate that. It's one of my pet peeves of all time. But I was at an uh, outdoor flea market one time, around that time of year, and it was the ground. Was, there was a lot of dew on the ground. It was cold that day. I had a coat on. And some guy had a box full of newly hatched chicks sitting on the ground in the dewy, wet ground with no heat. And they were chirping, and they were huddling, and I said, those chicks need some heat. This is it's too cold for them out here. Nah, they don't need no heat. I said, no, hell I don't. Yes, they do. Of course, he wanted to argue with me. And I thought, well, you know, they're going to get a chill. And um, somebody's going to take them chicks home. And one, they're going to start dying on you. Because it was really cold and it was wet. So, no, they don't. You have to go by how they sound. But yes, newly hatched chicks don't have feathers. They don't have anything to keep them warm. Yes, they do need heat. Um, they don't may not need as much heat as some people think they do. Now, um, people say, well, you know, they go outside with broody hens all the time. You know why they do, you know why they are able to do that though? Because mama is a walking heater. They go out there. They know the guy was. 50 degrees outside, and it's, you know, they're going down there pecking on stuff. I don't, I would not advise them going out in the wet, but if it's dry, it's 50 degrees and sunny, and they're outside with mama, and they're pecking around the ground, you know what happens when they get cold? They start cheeping and running to mama, trying to get under her, and you know what mama does? She lowers herself down, they all get under her, and they heat up again, and she sits there until they get ready to venture out. She's a walking heater. That is why chicks with a broody hen are often out way earlier they avoid coccidiosis more than brooder raised chicks and they just they have a more rounded education so I love the best brooder ever is a mama hen um, now first timer sometimes are a little tricky they can kill their own chicks um, but you know that's that's basically the long and short of brooding chickens get your brooder ready before you go pick up any chicks make sure the heat spot is on one end make sure you know what the temperature is under there you don't want to cook them and you don't want it to be in the 70s you want it to be at least up to you know around 90 degrees or so um, and in one spot that they can go to and then get away from and don't put your water in your feet under that heat 
Um, so they have to get out to eat and drink, then go back, and they wreck. You'll, you'll be surprised at what they do. If they are all chirping loudly and trying to huddle together all the time, and like massively, frantically huddling, they're too cold. If one chick is cheeping and only one, it's something to do with that chick. It's not that it's too cold. So um, set it all up, get it all ready, raise your water up about that much. That'll be about to there so that they can have it, you know, at their shoulder level or a little bit higher than on the ground. Put some rocks or something in it, some, you know, a clean rocks or, you know, some pebbles or something that they can peck at and touch. And make sure that you dip their beaks into that water within the first 24 hours. And um, as they get more feathered, you can raise that heat further and further away. If it's a bright sunny day and it's 80 degrees outside, you could even take them carefully outside in something so they can get out of the sun and they can't, they're not susceptible to hawks, something very safe so they can go outside and peck around the grass for a little bit. So um, I hope this helps and um, I'm going to do a live and um, I don't know where I'm going to do it. I may try to do it tonight but I want to let, give enough people time to see the video, this video, and then we'll talk about it and you can ask questions or or whatever you want to do but this is the way I've been doing it for 15 years and I've never had any issues from anything I've done with with the chicks I mean they've like I said I at one point with one group of chicks I put a little stick across the brooder it was only like that far off the ground and a chick was on it and it jumped off and jumped onto another chick right on the back of the neck boom that chick was gone in in minutes so I mean it, it doesn't that's all it takes really um, it was just a freak accident <laughs> Um, it doesn't, that hardly ever happens, but that's just, that can happen. Just things happen. So, but always, these right here are your best weapon throughout the whole, the whole time you own chickens, not just raising chicks. Well, there you go. We'll, we'll see when we're going to do that live later, okay? Talk to you later. Bye.